Welcome to the Good Fight Radio Show, a program dedicated to bringing you vital and uncompromised truths that you won't hear in the mainstream media, discussing contemporary issues in light of the Bible and how these issues relate to family, culture, and the church. The heart of this show is to glorify Jesus Christ and expose the works of darkness as He is commanded in Ephesians 5.11. Now here's your host, Good Fight Ministries' own Chad Davidson. Welcome back to the Good Fight Radio Show. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And with me, as always, is the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. How are we doing today? Um, really blessed, bro. Have a great day, man. Amen. How about you, bro? Amen. Good, good. Praise good to Lord. hear. Also with <laughs> us, as always, is the show's producer, Tony Palacio. How are you doing today? Thankful and rejoicing in the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. I don't know how you guys are out where you are, but we're a little cooler than usual here in California. I know it's really rough, and if I mention that we're at like 50 degrees or They're something, laugh at us. somebody might laugh, especially because I saw a sister on the live stream at Blessed Hope Chapel last night uh, during the teaching was writing and said, yeah, it was negative 30 in uh, Saskatchewan. I hope I say that right. Canada. Is this yeah. Saskatchewan? Yep. Tony, you like hockey. Yeah, I, you, you're, you're okay with the Canadian <laughs> names. Uh, and she had said how, how freezing it was. And then it's, she said, it's so much better now. It's only negative 20. So, oh, uh, <laughs> it is sunbathing now. Though, man, because Chad has got a t-shirt on. I noticed <laughs> t-shirt shorts. It's like army shorts. And I'm looking under the table and he has like tennis shoes with no socks so there's no heater on up here either so no wonder yeah amen amen and, i dress and, somewhat like that but not today <laughs> got a flannel on but uh but wherever you are we are blessed that you are listening and uh hopefully sharing these things i think these are really important and today's topic is going to be one of great importance because we're talking about personal questions if you yeah. have uh we do like to take these so when you shoot them in we can't get to every one of them uh especially you know formatting and, and things like that that we're working on trying to get information out to you questions that we get all the time but when we can, we do. And so this was a question I had seen come through. I sent it to Joe. Joe's like, yeah, let's answer this. Because whenever somebody has something this distressing, it's time to talk about it. And this isn't the first time we've ever seen these emails, right? This is something that yeah. we, we've seen, we've talked about, we pray about, we try to counsel through. So hopefully this episode will be somewhat of a pastoral care for someone who may be going through maybe some questions and doubts in terms of this question. Yeah, so, a lot of people who relate to this. Yeah, amen. So I'm just going to read it, and then uh, we'll get right into it. It says, Hello, Good Fight Ministries. I have read your article on selling your soul and have watched a few clips from They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll on YouTube. I used to be a fan of rock and heavy metal music before I started seeking God back in November of last year. Now, when I was a teenager, I remember seeing an ad for a show on one of the rock music channels in my country where a man in the ad said, and I quote, take you to church, not me. I sold my soul a long time ago for rock and roll. Now, fast forward to my adolescent years. I was around 19 or 20 at the time, and I had begun to get more seriously into rock and heavy metal. And I had a friend from my school years who was a fan as well. And one day I recalled the ad and I had seen years ago and I repeated the line about selling my soul to rock and roll. After saying that, my friend and I would net, whenever we met up, would repeat that line and laugh about it. Now I've just realized what a serious mistake I made all those years ago, and I'm fearful of the consequences of it, not only for myself, but my friend as well. Have my friend and I actually ended up selling our souls to the devil for saying that, even in jest? Will God forgive it, and can we still be saved? Yeah, for those who have questions as to whether someone could you know, surrender, <coughs> surrender their soul might be the best way to put it to Satan, willfully uh they can just go listen to our podcast that we did on that before and an article uh, you did and the uh, article which is right. excellent article in Antonio our, uh, put it in the link yeah you can just check out the, the uh, article in the link as well but uh my, my heart goes out to this brother because i could relate because i was in that a very very similar situation brother if you're listening right now and uh just want to encourage you uh that there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever not an iota of doubt that you know the lord has open arms to receive you uh, if you've come to him through faith in Christ, uh, the scriptures say that Jesus died for all of our sins, including whatever you did, whether it was in seriousness or it sounds like in your case it was in jest. I could relate uh, to what you're going through because when I first became a Christian, I went through a kind of a similar situation. In fact, uh, I had actually not just, you know, made a joke about selling my soul. I had written a song about it. And although I, I, I didn't take it too seriously, I just thought, 
you know, I didn't believe Satan existed at the time. And I didn't realize I'd be, I was being played like a flute. And I was channeling a bunch of lyrics. And before I knew it, I was writing things way beyond my uh, mental capacity at the time as a teenager. But uh, my f uh, first song that I wrote uh, say that I was falling forever deeper in, into the hole. I couldn't be freed. The devil was grasping my soul. I could hear my mother screaming and my sisters dreaming and my father dying and my brother crying. And at first, I was troubled at the devil for the reason, but then the choice had dawned to be my soul or that of my family is to be treasoned. I couldn't win to be a devil or a demon. And then the song goes, you know, goes on and then at the end, there I light the final bottom to say goodbye. And so I won or maybe so and so I left with my soul and began to rock and roll. That's where my lead guitar would come in. Uh, as I celebrate, it was an anthem of praise uh, to just being, you know, f what was, you know, pseudo-freedom uh, to just rock and roll, as though rock and roll is freedom. Uh, and it was a lie. And uh, I wrote that song. I gave it to a friend of mine who was a drummer. Uh, as we were talking about forming a band, and he puts uh, uh, finishing touches on it and uh, made it even better than it was when I got done with it. Anyway, what's interesting... Uh, I don't believe he at that point, or I, myself, in writing this song, uh, initially, uh, had sold our souls. I didn't believe in Satan. And I already belonged to Satan at the time. So the Bible says all of us before we're saved, uh, that we're ever father the devil, you know. It says in Ephesians chapter 2 that uh, very, very clearly that we walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now is at work in the children of disobedience. So we are children of disobedience, children of wrath, hostile in our minds toward God. And our natural state was already servitude to Satan to one degree or another. Now, someone can say, hey, you know what? I'm going to make a decision to just totally surrender willfully my life consciously to Satan and give them more active place in his life. And that's oftentimes how people end up being demon-possessed and so forth. You don't have to do that to become demon-possessed. You could just simply get into, you know, different forms of Eastern mysticism, different forms of yoga, uh, whereby you open up your, your, your soul to the spirit entities, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, uh, just all kinds of things can open you up to the demonic world. But uh, whether, you know, someone's sincere in their desire to sell their soul to Satan, or whether they're innocently, uh, and I don't mean really innocently, I mean in jest, that wouldn't be so innocent, but in regard to it not being purposeful, making a joke along those lines, in either case, even if you had been totally sincere, I believe you could still be redeemed, still be forgiven, because the scriptures say if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from not some, not most, but all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 9. So I really, my heart goes out to you because when I first became a believer, uh, you know, I wondered, would the Lord accept me because I was quite rebellious? I was very anti-Christ. I didn't believe in Jesus as the Savior of the world. So in my rebellion, I made statements to this day that I still think about and get teary over and regret mm -hmm. uh, as a non-believer that still hurts my heart, you know, even though I know I've been forgiven, you know, but there's times in my prayer where I'm like, Lord, I, I still say I'm sorry sometimes, you know, for uh, some of the things I said in, in ignorance and, in, in, you know, I even, you know, with my friends, you know, my mom will tell me this story once in a while uh, where, you know, she told me, you know, she said, I remember when you were sitting by that heater, just told me this recently in her old house that she, I just said, you know, we, she just moved out of. And she said, I remember you saying, you know, you didn't believe in God and you were going to convince your friends that he didn't exist. And she was speaking of the Christian God. I believe there was something out there. And and then she said, it was not long after that that you went through this huge ordeal. Yeah, I did. You know, I totally opened myself up to these forces of darkness. And she said, God was chasing me. Well, he won, thank God, you know. Uh, but interestingly enough, that when I became a Christian, I recognized God's power. Because in the midst of one of my mystical experiences, when I'd opened myself up to the devil, I was in a state of paralysis. I couldn't move. And there was a humming sound, a loud, like, you know, high-pitched sound just reverberating through my being because I started meditating and praying or in my own way to this force, whatever subconscious forces might exist. And it wasn't subconscious forces, although I thought they were. And I was channeling these forces. I thought they were until they just became darker, darker. And like that one song I just mentioned, and I was writing lyrics like, born with an attitude on his face, the trickery of Satan was bestowed. And uh, lyrics like, treacherous meadows touched by the devil, burdened with calamities and subdued by disease. And I'm just giving you one-liners from full some some full songs. And Little Miss Medium and still Little, Little Miss Muffet, can you wake the dead masters of your sleep? I didn't know that mediums challenged, channeled masters in the New Age movement, you know? And uh, all these lyrics were coming through me, and I thought it was my subconscious. 
But as covers were getting pulled down, the entities, be entities began to reveal themselves. And I realized I'm in touch with some dark forces, it seems. I wrote a song called Talking Voices in My Head. Are they good or are they bad? They shake my bed to comfort me, but I see it uncomfortably. The high-pitched humming or buzzing will never go. It only seems to want to grow. And uh, in the midst of one of those experiences, after things got darker and darker, I cried out to God. I, it was a feeble, the weakest prayer perhaps ever prayed in the universe. But it was a, there was a mustard seed of faith there, thank God. And I just said, only if this is good to God, only in goodness. I didn't know the Bible said test the spirits to see where they're from God, but I didn't believe in the devil. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a minute. There's something I'm in touch with that they're, they're disembodied spirits, or they don't have bodies. I can't see them. They're pulling down my covers. They're tormenting me by, you know, my ear and everything else. I think they were, you know, just, you know, just weird stuff. And I was experiencing magic, even the so-called positive side of white magic, ecstatic experiences at the same time. So I was really confused. So I just cried out, only if this, or actually the words were only in goodness. Like, only if this is good. Only if, you know, not not understanding if God fully existed or truly existed. But I did know if Satan existed and this thing was evil, which it seemed to be very, very evil, then God must exist. So I cried out, only in goodness. And boom, man, bam, my experience stopped like that. Bam. I was like, what in the world? And about a week or so later, I don't know, a week or two, uh, I wasn't keeping track of my days because it was such a heavy experience. I was in La La Land. It was like, what in the world? Uh, same experience, state of paralysis, couldn't move. Usually it'd be in that twilight period when you're just before sleep. And then I cried out again, but more directly, you know, God, if this isn't good or I can't remember my exact words, just cried out more directly to, and I and I was cried out to the biblical God at this point, knowing and believing that, and, and boom, it stopped again, bam. And I was absolutely convinced, you know, and I gave my life to Jesus. I got on my knees and repented and cried out to him in faith. And, and uh, I, as I say, I tore down all my wallpaper, which was all my Zeppelin posters and my Lone Jimi Hendrix poster. And I kicked in my Fender amp so I wouldn't be tempted to play anymore. Got rid of my guitar, gave it to someone. And I questioned, though, even though I was crying out to God, would he accept me because I didn't fully understand the gospel yet. And his prevenient grace was at work in my heart, drawing me. And I opened up the Bible and began to read it through this early on in this time. And I was reading the gospel, and I think it was John, which is kind of funny. And I was reading through the crucifixion, and I began to tears start to stream down my cheeks. And I realized, wow, you know, look what he did for us, you know. Mm -hmm. And it blew me away. And I don't remember crying for anybody. For some time at that point, I was kind of a hardened, rebellious teenager at that point, and my heart was being changed, and I placed my faith in Christ, and I began to just uh, realize what he'd done, and started going through the scripture, couldn't get enough of the word, and to this day, I'm still, by the grace of God, going strong, and and it's great because he took that which was evil, like happened to Joseph in his life, uh, and turned it for the good. And the scriptures say God works all things together for the good for those who love him. They call the according to his purpose. And I began to witness to my family members, the same family members, which I guess you could say in jest or at least in song, thematically for the sake of glorifying rock and roll, but not intending it to be literal, selling their souls. I was able to see uh, my mom and my dad eventually too, uh, but all five of my siblings, all myself and the four others, so all seven of us in time came to Jesus the first few years was everybody but my dad, and then he just died a year ago, just over a year ago, uh, just before I think he turned 93, and he came to the Lord not long before that. So, but but brother, and I call you a brother because if you're putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. you are accepted. And uh, there's certain scriptures that resonated with me and stood out because of the circumstances which I found myself, and that's how God builds a lot of your testimony. Those things that were by you first reveals himself to you. And these are scriptures that I think would help you as well and anybody else because you don't have to have thought you may have sold your soul to relate to these scriptures because anybody who's humble before the Lord and recognizes that they're doomed because of their sin, recognizes that they should be toast because of their proud, rebellious hearts before they were saved, will, will struggle at when they first come before they understand God's grace as to whether or not God will accept them. But then when you read the Gospels and then you read the explication, like in Romans, of the meaning of the Gospel, uh, which is the most incredible book explaining what the gospel is, uh, you, you realize, wow, God is such a God of mercy. It says in Romans eleven thirty two that he desires to have mercy on all. But one of the scriptures, I don't think I ever tried to memorize it, 
at the end of John 6, 37 there, it says, whoever comes to him, he will by no wise cast away. And I've still got it memorized. You know, I don't use the King James very much. I had it, I used the King James a lot then, but he won't cast you away, whoever comes to him. It doesn't say some people or most of you come to me, I won't cast away, but there'll be a few of you that I don't, won't accept. No, he said, whoever. And brother, that has your name on it. And we're not sharing your name in case you want it to be private. He, he promises, bro, he will not cast you away, that his arms are open, that he loves you dearly. Uh, the scripture says he tasted death for everyone, and that would include you. And the scriptures say he's the propitiation or payment for not only our sins, those that belong to the Lord, uh, those who are elect, those who've become part of the beloved, but for the sins of the whole world. First John 2, 2. Who's the whole world in John? First John 5, 19. We know that we are of God, but the whole world is of the power in the power of the evil one. He died for all those who are in the power of the evil one. So he provided salvation for you. The question is, you know, whether you'll accept it, whether you'll come to him. One of the scriptures I found most, probably, the, you know, one of the biggest blessings to me that is still such a huge blessing to me that I encourage people who come to Christ and want to know if they'd be accepted. Of course, you explain the love of God to people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes him should not perish, but have everlasting, have everlasting life. Verse 17, he didn't come to the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. So, of course, you want to start with, you know, the character of God. God is love, 1 John 1, or 4.4, 4, and 4, uh, or 4.8 and 4.16. That God is love, the intention of God, the will of God, that he doesn't will that any would perish, but that all uh, would come to repentance, 2 Peter 3.9. He wills that all would be saved and come to knowledge of truth, 1 Peter 2, 4, many such passages. Even Jesus said in John 18, doesn't will that any of these little ones perish. So we have the love of God, we have the will of God, and then we have the provision of God in giving his son, which I had already mentioned a few scriptures that he died for all. So those are all, all very, very important. But then I love Paul's example. Paul calls himself the worst or the chief of all sinners. And brother and sisters, brothers and sisters, do you realize God said, or Paul says, that God saved him so that you and I who would come later to Christ, could know that he'd also save us because he was the worst or the chiefest. So just think about that. Paul was having Christians killed. Paul was filled, he says, with rage and anger. He was going to the homes of believers, dragging them out of their homes, uh, forcing them, trying to force them to deny Christ. He, he presided over Stephen's uh, martyrdom. When Stephen went to deny Christ, he was stoned to death. And they put Stephen's clothes at Paul's feet. And Paul was the, you know, the leader in the Sanhedrin that was overseeing the murder of Christians. And when he became a Christian, he felt so bad. And he must have wondered, would he be accepted? What's going on, you know? Uh, at, at times, when he, when he first came to the Lord, like, wow, you know? Must have been like, you know, he had assurance through faith in Christ, but he recognized also in his humility how he deserved wrath. And here's what he said in 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. Here's this trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. We should fully accept this reality. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, or King James, the chief. But for the very reason, now check this out, he tells you why Paul was saved. And of course, God loved him, saved him because he wanted to become a trophy, to become a trophy of his grace. But he said, for that very reason, I was shown mercy. What very reason? Because God came to the world to save sinners. So that in me, the worst of sinners, it's even more than that though, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. So Paul is saying God saved him because Christ came to the world to save sinners, but also so that he might be shown as an example to others. Uh, display his immense patience, which uh, is also you know a reference to to his kindness, the hesed of God in the Old Testament, which is just a multidimensional word for God's patience, his kindness, his loving kindness, his covenantal love, his faithful love, his, you know, on and on and on. They don't even know how to translate it because it has so many beautiful meanings, but I believe that the whole Old Testament, the New Testament too, is supercharged with that meaning when we read words like patience in regard to God, his life, or his, his grace, his charis, his mercy, or charis. Christ Jesus might display his immense patience he was incredibly patient with you, brother. When you were joking like that, he was like, poor, 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 poor young man, you know. Uh, and he says, as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. He's an example to you. Look at him and say, wow, God saved Paul who said, 
and by the way, you can't claim to be the chief of sinners. You know, that's Paul's, that's Paul's uh, claim. And it was for you that God saved him and others that we might also know. In fact, Paul goes on to write just a few verses later. This is a good and pleasing to God our Savior who wants all people, including you, brother, and you, sister, and whoever's out there, to be saved. That's God's heart. He loves you. And to come to a knowledge of the truth. He wants you to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one meter between God and mankind. Not, not three, not Mary, not a bunch of saints. One, the man Christ Jesus. This is verse, the very next verse. Who gave himself as a ransom for, not some, not most, but all people. This is now. This uh, has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And if, a little bit later in Timothy, I love this too. First Timothy four thirty says, "This is why we labor and strive," writes Paul, "because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people." In what sense is He the Savior of all people? Well, He gave His Son for all people. Uh, he wills that all would be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Jesus is, well, John. I think it's John one twenty nine. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He provides salvation for the whole world, but the whole world isn't saved because there's that broad road and most people go down that broad road to destruction. So what's he saying here? Well, listen to the end of the verse. It says, because we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people and especially of those who believe. So it's imperative that you understand that even though he provided salvation for all people, uh, he's especially the Savior of those who believe because they're the, they're the one they're the ones who salvation becomes efficacious uh for because they put their faith in Christ because you can't be saved without trusting and turning from your sin and putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ so if you have turned from a life of rebellion against him and you're putting your trust in him uh brother you're a brother and you're saved and you're saved as as a, you know as the, as the most saved person walking the planet right now because uh none of us have reached glory yet and we're saved by his grace through faith. And if you were to die today in the faith, the Bible says these things are written, 1 John 5, 13. The Bible says life is in the Son, 1 John 5, 12. That life is in the Son. And then in verse 13 it says, uh, you know, it says that how we know we're saved. Uh, it, it talks about that. It, it says very, very clearly in 1 John 5, 13 that we may know that we have eternal life. How is it that we may know that we have eternal life? If we have faith in the Son, if we're trusting the Son, these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. So if you are trusting Christ, you have eternal life. We rejoice with you, brother, and just keep seeking Him and, and continue to put your trust in Him. And we praise God for your salvation. Yeah, I think it's really important, you know, that you know, and, and Joe had gone over quite a bit some of the songs that he had said, not even in jest, you know. And I know that my, in my own personal testimony, we, we were just we just did an episode a couple of weeks ago regarding Slipknot, which was my favorite band as a unregenerate, uh, horrible, unsaved person Can at I add the to time. That list, man? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I'm yeah. <laughs> uh, reprobate uh, all and so forth. But and you know, plenty of those lyrics, you know, talking about three blasphemy and um, you know, contagion, and I'm sitting at the side of Satan. And these are all lyrics that I had memorized because I had meditated on these things, and then I would sing them. You know, and yet, uh, just as Joe mentioned, the same struggle I know for me, you know, after I came to Christ was elevating sin because sadly enough, I think a lot of, a lot of, you know, false teachers, they minimize sin as they, they like to use those word mistakes, like they're no big deal, you know, when, no, it's a big deal when you sin against God, he made laws and you broke them. But for me, I maxim, I was maximizing it even as a younger believer questioning like lord why would you forgive me all these horrible things that i've done not recognizing the power and the potency of what christ did on the cross you know and yeah. then realizing even as a, as a younger believer that i was putting more strength in the power of the sin that was committed than i was in the power of the blood that was shed that according to acts 2028 20, is specifically the blood of god himself he shed his own blood for us so it, it you know you have a good good god you know yeah, I, was, I remember uh, counseling a believer as, when I was an early believer too, who was like felt their sin had uh, was too too much for the Lord to, you know, forgive them. You know, something a lot of people go through. And uh, I shared with that person. I said, "Do you think your sin is greater than the blood of Christ and you know the grace of God?" And I didn't realize how that impacted that person until years later. The person said, "You know what?" Uh, when I shared that with them, it, it broke that spell that Satan had over them. Uh, that the Bible says that you know 
God gives greater grace in James chapter 4 when it's talking about a life of sin. And Paul said in the book of Romans where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And uh, he, he breaks the bondages, you know. He died for all sin. So uh, anyone who, you know, repents, puts their faith in Christ can be saved. Uh, in fact, uh, there's many scriptures that talk about people doing worse than what you mentioned, uh, the brother that was that had written in, uh, that had done far worse. He's, think of people who knew Christ as their Lord and Savior and then turned their backs on him and uh, walked away knowingly from the Savior and brought reproach upon his name. And these people were still accepted when they came back. And some people, I'm sure many people in the audience say, that's me, that was me, that was me. And guess what? That was all of us to one degree or another whenever we fall short of God's glory, you know? Even though we may not enter into a life of apostasy, uh, when we fall short of God's glory and and sin is, you know, is transgression of God's moral law. And it's not, it's the opposite of faith and faith works through love. It's no, at that very moment, we're not loving him. And I'm not, you know, uh, making the two equal, but I'm saying, what about those who actually fall away? And, you know, Jesus talked to Peter about how, you know, he talked to him about how he would, you know, fall away, and he did, and deny Christ. And and he had said to Peter and the other apostles, if you deny me, I'll deny you. Yet Peter was accepted back, and he wrote uh, different books that we read in the New Testament. He was a leader of the early church in some ways in regard to the first half of the book of Acts, you know, wasn't a pope, you know, but he was one of the leaders of the early church. Uh, and that's important to understand. Jesus talked about the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. And he left his father willingly, came back, and the father said, my son was lost, but now he's found. Was dead, but now he's alive. And he threw a big party for him. And this is important because the son I always hits me when I go through that that teaching of Jesus, that story, is the, the idea there is about repentance there in Luke, in Luke uh, 15. Uh, and how the angels of God rejoice over one sin that comes to repentance. Then he goes on to tell that story and how the father had open arms and he threw a party for him. And he didn't believe he could be accepted. But there's many scriptures that teach, for instance, Romans 11, 23 teaches of the Jews who were broken off of the salvation tree uh, because of their disbelief. He says, uh, uh, and they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again. So even people who committed apostasy and turn away from the Lord can be brought back. In James 5, 19 and 20, it says, Brethren, if any of you turn from the truth and one converts him back, he'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. In other words, the multitude of sins that the backs are like the prodigal son commits in their backs in the state. If they truly return, uh, he will forgive them. And I think that's really, really important. Uh, Isaiah 55, 7 says, if, uh, Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him. And you are God, for he will abundantly pardon. So, well, I mean, the Lord is so beautiful. He made you in his image. He loves you. Uh, he became a man. And, I mean, can you imagine? This is God, the creator of the entire universe, the uncreated creator, partaking of our humanity, not just for a period of time. He is now the resurrected God-man. He did this out of love before he even died for our sins, but he did this so he could make us one with him and reconcile us. And it says he died a death, but not just any death, even it says the death on the cross, Philippians chapter 2, a special and a spe a, a sp specifically horrible death. Why? Why do you do that? Because he loves you. And I can say this, brother, you trust in Jesus? Well, I said it recently. Uh, I believe that if you're just the only person on the planet, he still would have died for you because Jesus said he'd leave the 99 and go for that one lost sheep. And that's the heart of God. And that's amazing love. So just rejoice in his amazing love for you. Mm -hmm. Not just the brother we're uh, dealing with his letter, but everybody. What an awesome God we have. Press on and rejoice. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to the Good Fight Radio Show brought to you by Good Fight Ministries. If you're blessed by this show and would like to partner with us, please consider visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com slash goodfight. Or you can write to us at P.O. Box 2202, Simi Valley, California, 93062. Or call us toll free at 1-866-JC-TRUTH. That's 1-866-528-7884. We hope you'll tune in next time on the Good Fight Radio Show.